please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to Mr. John Bennett. Thank you very much indeed. There's a switch on here, and I just said you've got one second delay, so be careful what you say. Good start. Okay. Good afternoon to you. And before I do anything at all, anything at all, <clears throat> I, a very big thank you to Dari and to Anne Lynch particularly. I've been here since late Thursday afternoon, and uh, I suppose you call it another than to welcome, but it's been absolutely wonderful. So many, many thanks. What I'm going to talk to you about today is really uh, not necessarily the right way to do things. It's not necessarily the right way to run a business. This is very much about a personal story, a personal journey, and uh, some serious mistakes I've made on the way, but actually some good things that we've done, and how we've had an effect in one way or another on some, <clears throat> some pretty interesting lives, some people who have some pretty checkered backgrounds, some people who come from some pretty challenged backgrounds. So today, I suppose, is primarily about what I did running an organization called Packet, P-A-C-K hyphen I, big I, big T. Packet, which is a bit, bit like I would call probably a, a mini Amazon. It's a packaging, storage, and distribution. So, sitting here as a social, the CEO of the Welsh Social Enterprise Coalition is actually what I do now and have been doing for the last two and a half years. Today, this afternoon, is about me running Packet and the stories that have gone on behind and within Packet. So I wanted to share those with you. But if you want to have a brief chat about the coalition and what I do there now, I'm more than happy to pick that up with you guys later on. <coughs> so, I suppose, give you a bit, of, uh, a bit of background, first of all. I suppose a lot of what I've done is, is, is been part of my own personal education. It actually took me until I was probably, I don't know, mid-40s, and I'm considerably older than that now, to my mid-40s to decide that this is really what I want to do. And that education process has taken on a myriad of different forms. And I have to say that uh, I was in Budapest in June. And I delivered a chat about what I do as, a, as an entrepreneur and things like that. And then this very imposing lady marched down the center aisle. And I thought, for goodness sake, what have I said? There was this Dory was there marching down the aisle. And I would made some comment about central government Local authorities, other organizations don't really get or don't really understand this social enterprise thing. And I thought, I'm in there for a bit of a hammering here. And Dory came up to me and she said, thank goodness, she said, I thought you were going to give us academics a real hiding as well. Because academics, in some respects, I find quite scary, if I'm absolutely honest with you. But anyway, Dory was delightful. And we ended up a long conversation. And here I am. But the education process also has been an interesting one because last year, last year, I was very, very fortunate to be awarded an honorary fellowship from <clears throat> the University of Wales. And I thought it's time for my kids to come and see their old man getting an award because I've been to see them do theirs. And my youngest, my two sons, my elder and my youngest son, were sitting in the second row from the front. And I started off my piece after I'd had my, received my award. Bear in mind, I'm in a, si a situation, an academic situation. And my first line was to the assembled audience, 450 plus students, who needs education? And then I went on to say, why be educated? And I had this vision of my youngest son sort of curling up underneath the seat in front of him, thinking, what is he going to say now? The fact is, what I wanted to say to them is that, <clears throat> I suppose, education, society says yes in a big way about education, and we have to get it right. We have to make sure because society demands and expects of us to be educated. But what I have to say is that the education that I've had and the story that I will tell you is the education I've had in my own particular world. My world of social enterprise. I've witnessed a different kind of education, something completely different in many different forms. I've been visited in townships in Johannesburg. I've worked with street kids in Cape Town. We've been through 
Aboriginal communities, learning about they, how they educate their own. Different kinds of education, but good, sound, solid education. Education that has taken them through and given them the life skills, if you like, to go forward and do what it is that they do. And the one thing that stayed with me, if nothing else, is that when I went through the township as a young man, big, big, tall fella, and he said, do you know, he said the one thing, he was very proud. I mean, the township was a tough environment. But the one thing he said, he said, do you know what my grandfather said to me? He said, <clears throat> education sets you free. And that line has come back to me time and time and time again. And I think that's pretty much part of what it is because I'm 67, 68, I can't remember. I've forgotten. That's an age thing. But the fact remains, at my age, it still doesn't alter the fact that there's still a big learning curve. It continues to go on. It continues to go on. So as part and parcel of what I've done, Packet has been a big, has had a massive impact on my life, I have to say. But part and parcel of the social enterprise stuff that I've done has taken me, I've been very, very fortunate. It's taken me to me a lot of organizations throughout the world doing this kind of stuff. I'm not a public speaker, but I do enjoy very much talking about what I do, what I believe in, and what I love. This is a very good example of a great, great organization. You can turn up at Fair Start on a Tuesday morning, and if you can prove that you are drug-free, you are homeless, you have no sexual offenses against your name, you've got a job. You go in on the bottom floor and you stay there for six weeks. You work through the systems, chopping vegetables, cleaning pans, whatever it may be. Six weeks later, you go up onto the first floor. And then you carry on because the ultimate aim is to come out of a 16-week process as a sous chef. And this is what these guys do. Simple, simple process. Tough school, tough school, but they move on. The same principles in Long Medina, up in the north of Western Australia. And there I learned... About, and I made a serious judgment. I put somebody in a box, and I'll tell you about that later. Understanding how they work, how their communities work. How London, uh, we've got an office in, in London that runs an organization called Divine Chocolate. And if you're into chocolate, it's pretty darn good. They've built working relationships with cocoa farms out in Kenya. In North Wales, <clears throat> this is a sign on the outside of a restaurant up there. And that says it all. This is where the magic happens. Magic happens. Magic happens with people. And today is all about people. A Travel Matters. It's a, an organization, a travel organization, that is run by people with mental health challenges. This lady, a fine arts degree student, a driven woman, if ever there was one, a wonderful woman who has created some seriously wonderful jewelry out of recycled glass. Uh, that works specifically with people with learning difficulties and some ex-offenders as well. And this is where I come in. This is what we are. This is who we are. Are there anybody? I, I, you, you've got to work with me on this one. How, do you understand the concept of triple bottom line? Yeah? Yes. Cool. Thank God for that. Well, that's a good start. Because I went to an academic gathering in Melbourne two years ago. It was a preamble to the World Forum, and I was invited with the movers and the shakers and the academics to go to uh, a gathering. And I listened to a professor who's based in Auckland. He's a, a Maori, and he talked about a fourth bottom line, and I thought, steady now. We've got enough problems with three of them, let alone four. But the fourth one is actually what we do anyway. It's certainly what we do in Wales, and I would suggest it's certainly what I've seen this morning is what is done here. And that fourth bottom line, that fourth bottom line, he told me and the assembled audience there, this is about community, this is spiritual. That fourth bottom line. The truth is what you should be doing anyway. Interesting, sad in some respects, I had to go 12,000 miles to listen to the obvious. Anyway, pure facts and figures, this is what we do. We're an internet, we're a bit like Amazon Internet Fulfillment Company. 28 staff, 19 have some pretty challenging backgrounds, and we talk about those, and turnover is vanity, profit, etc., etc. But the fact remains, within the social enterprise sector, we're actually quite a big fish. But the important thing is, before I go any further, before I get verbally pinned to the wall, as I was fairly recently about being non-PC, I talk about my colleagues and show their pictures freely here, 
if only because they talk about me when I'm not there anyway. So that's been always been the deal. That's always been the deal. This is just to give you an idea. We're full of pictures uh, to give you an idea of the size of what it is that we do and how we work. And also, this is where the whole story starts. Because Packet, for me, has always been, it's always been about its people. It's always been about the people with whom we work, the challenges that together we have experienced, because this is not a singular journey. There are some significantly challenges going on. And this is where two of my colleagues to start with come into the, into the loop. They are part of a business that does packaging, fulfillment, etc. We've created a business model now, a simple business model, because at the end of the day, we're sticking things in envelopes and packing boxes and sending them off around the world. We've taken a business model which we've replicated in the north of England, in Scotland, in the middle of England, and in Melbourne, in Australia. And the first one in Wakefield, I got completely wrong. I got it wrong because I worked on the principle that everybody must understand what it is that we do. Everybody's going to buy into my vision. Everybody's going to buy into the principle of, of social justice, environment, all this kind of stuff. And I worked on far, far too light a touch. And I won't say the people, the individuals were involved were bad people. They weren't. But I didn't give them the good, sound, solid messages they need. Look, if you're going to pick up my brand, if you're going to try and replicate a packet brand, then these are the guidelines, and they needed to be much, much firmer. But also, given that I wasn't very happy about the way things were going, and it actually took me too long to realize as well, is that ultimately it comes back to the people thing again, because we're actually working with some pretty vulnerable people. And Arwen, he of the wonky moustache, is been with us for six, seven years now. Fairly challenged in his own way. He's got some pretty challenging dis um, learning, learning and, um, and uh, numeracy issues. And Anna, well, she's barking mad, and she will tell you that anyway. Um, there's this wonderful expression that goes around. It's certainly gone around our business. You need to be as mad, uh, as, mad as a box of frogs. I haven't quite worked that out yet, but I think the message is there. But Anna, Anna came to me, or should I say, when the whole thing started, I took Anna, and you'll see a picture of Marie later on, two of my colleagues who still work at Packet now, out of a day center. Do you understand day center? No? Day center is where people, um, people would put their offspring, those who got disabilities, in. it was basically a respite care place. So they went there for the day to give parents a bit of respite. Anyway, I took Anna and Marie out of a day center because I needed some work doing. And out of, it's a very, very condensed version of what it is that we do. But I needed somebody to pack some envelopes for me, put things in envelopes. And I took Anna and I took Marie out of a day center. And we started something there that actually seemed to work quite well. To the point, I thought, well, we can actually do something with this. This might actually work. So when somebody said to me, um, well, how is it going to work, John? I said, I really haven't got the faintest idea. Because I had a lovely conversation with a group of people this morning. They said, well, you know, what about the business plan? What about the marketing plan? Business plans, marketing plans meant absolutely nothing to me at all. I've since since a really good business plan is written on one side of A4. But the important thing was, from the point of view of structure, Getting the marketing right, getting, doing the due diligence as you would if you're going to set up any kind of business at all. I did none of that. I did absolutely none of that. A, because I didn't really know what I was doing. But secondly, I just sort of had this innate belief that whatever it was that we were planning to do was going to work. And I would hope that a lot of you here, in one form or another, will probably choose your own particular paths. Why? Because you have this innate belief here, here, wherever it may be. One, one way or another, what it is that you plan is going to work. I've also since learned to surround myself with people who actually know what they're talking about and plug in the gaps that I have. There's some fairly significant gaps in my skill sets. But I didn't have that. And now, 24 years on, I'm a little bit wiser. Packet, we started Packet in 1988. So as I say, we have 24 years under our belt now 
but it's been a challenging time. It's been a challenging time. But this is where it all started. And this is Harry. Harry now drives a forklift truck in Tesco's. He's been through the mill, but we gave him the skills as we progressed and worked with him in an environment that we built slowly but surely, storing pallets, packing boxes, and beginning to charge for the goods and services that we were supplying. And this young man now drives a forklift truck. He has his own place in society. He's there, he earns his own money. Whatever his challenges may, who cares? Who cares? The important thing is he delivers what is expected from him. But the great thing, the really good thing about it all is the fact, and there's no monetary value to this, but it's all about self-esteem. I just thought of something. I have a friend of mine, a um, guy who works at Packet, as a matter of fact. His car had broken down. He took the bus to work uh, fairly recently. And he said, I was in the bus queue. And he said, it's these little checkpoints sometimes that make things work, and you realize you're doing OK. Because he said, this young man was standing in the bus queue. And somebody was trying to engage with him. Challenging because he's got a Spurges and a few other things. So the challenges are there, trying to engage with him. And he said, the, uh, the, the guy who was talking to him said, what do you do? And Harry said, I'm going to work. That was all it was. But what he came up with were four words that, in the truth, were never, ever, ever, in the first 25 years of his life, they were never, ever, ever on his radar. He's just like you and me. What does he do? Every morning, he goes to work. Those kind of things that in any other walk of life, you just take, well, one takes for granted. I'm going to work. And that's what he does. This young man, Gary, and they say, this is all is this stories about individuals as we go. Gary has Poland's disease. He also has a first in black humor. It means one side of his body is sags. He has a, a withered left hand and one thing or another. He came to me to apply for a job as an administrator. And he came in, best bib and tucker, button suited, booted, everything else. And um, I suppose it was what you would call a severe attack of verbal diarrhea because he sat down in his chair and just could not stop gabbing away. And I said, steady. Just tell me about it. Because he started and said, I can't do this. I can't do it. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. All negatives. And I said, that's not what I want to hear. Just tell me. Tell me what you can do. The, one of his big problems is he couldn't lift a box properly because I've never, ever seen it before, and I've probably never seen it. But this guy physically slumped in the chair and thought, at least somebody wants to hear about what it is that I can do. Made a big effect on me, I have to say. So what's he doing now? Well, I tell you, I would not be without him. I mean, the man is a genius. He's my IT manager. He works for me. And thank the Lord he's there, because I get myself in some awful pickles at times. Gary, can you give me a hand, please? And up he turns. And he's... But he's changed. We touched on this young lady this morning. <coughs> Carol works in the mailing room, and she has uh, some pretty challenging backgrounds, and I would suggest to you that coming to Packet is very much, um, I suppose, coming to a place of sanity as much as anything. She goes home to some very, very dark areas. And she picked up an award here. Yeah. Indeed, as she did with a number of other colleagues of hers. Because whilst the, the vocabulary is not necessary there, everybody within Packet knows full well about health and safety. And I thought, I really want to do something about this. I want to get this certificate. I want them to have more than just earning their money because everybody at Packet is fully waged, fully pensioned, etc. Everybody, in fact, everybody's above minimum wage, which is good news. But we wanted something else. We wanted something else rather than just coming in and doing the day job. So after a torturous experience, you know when you sometimes you start a journey, you go down the road so far, you think, well, there's no point in turning back. We might as well carry on. Financially, it turned out to be an absolute nightmare. But it was a great experience because I challenged, if you like, the Chartered Institute of Health and Safety or whatever it was, saying, I want to try and do this course verbally because these guys don't have the numerical or the literacy skills to do written exams. Can't do that. Well, 
dare I say, there's a, probably a lot of you here who are exactly the same as me. Can't is not a word that exists in my vocabulary. Eventually, we got there. Eventually, we got there to the point that we went through the exam processes, externally verified, examined, etc., etc., etc. And once we got an acknowledgement that everybody passed, I said, right, we are, I'm going to take you all now for a presentation process to a business breakfast. Challenge number one, social skills. It was a really interesting experience. I took, it was run by the local chambers of commerce, and we took everybody there. Um, but before we got there, given in mind that I think there were six, six, six guys who got their certificates, by the time we'd announced that I need you here to be next Monday morning at 8 o'clock, because we're going to go up in two cars, I had mothers, fathers, aunties, uncles, next door neighbors, brothers, sisters, you name it, I'd hired a minibus because everybody was there wanting to celebrate this award process. So I say, we had a busload. We went in for the business breakfast, and that was an education, I have to say. Um, the bacon rolls and all the nice bits and pieces that you have. But then we went off to the award ceremony, and this young lady was sitting there like this, an absolute bag of nerves. But all she was being asked to do was to walk from the middle of an auditorium to the front to have a certificate. And she really couldn't do it. Again, it was the social skills, all the kind of things that so many of us just tend to take for granted. So I walked with her until about four steps before the end, and then I let her go. But the important thing is that coming back in the bus, she was talking to one of her colleagues about how the training had worked and I've actually found that training is really motivating. It really is a big motivator. And I heard her say to Marie, I ain't no one no more. So forget the double negatives. I can handle that. It's not a problem. But the important thing was that actually, a bit like Harry saying, I go to work. I ain't no one no more. Meant that not only has she paid to do a job, her somebody is significantly challenged literacy-wise, numeracy-wise, well, she actually recognized that she also has another kind of value. And this is the people thing. Again, bear in mind that all this is going on within a working environment, a big warehousing environment. Very, very small environment. We had before, I mean, this was in a room of probably 200, 300 square feet. We now, you saw the early one of the warehouse, we we're running out of 45,000 square feet. But this is a working business. This is a working business that needs to get out there to make a profit. But it's also being run by, I should have qualified the earlier statement about why do you do this social stuff. The comment was made to me by uh, a delightful man in, uh, in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And he came and talked, had a chat with me after I'd, I'd presented some awards there. Every other word was an F-bomb, but we'll leave that behind. But the important thing was, he said, why do you do this social stuff? And it was the first time anybody really asked me why. And I thought, well, that's, a, that's a quite a good question, really. Because my reaction is, well, that's what you do, isn't it? It just never really thought about it. But within all that there, looking back now... Why do we do what we do? Why are you even considering doing this kind of social enterprise stuff that doesn't even have a legal identity? It's because that's what we're all about. Because as I lead the Welsh Social Enterprise Coalition, the perfect situation would be that that, that institution, that organization should be defunct. Why? Because all businesses will be both socially and environmentally responsible anyway. Because that affects people like Carol. So she ain't no one, no more. She also recognizes, as indeed do others, that she has a credibility, not just as a production person, but also, I've actually got a little bit up here. She will tell you she's crap, unquote. She's not. She's had a pretty bum deal one way or another. But one way or another, as we did with Arwen, we've helped them get through those difficult times. This young man will charm the birds off a tree. I mean, he has a smile to die for. Very, very naughty boy when he came to see me. In truth, he's probably like a third son now. He's had his challenges, as indeed as Dave next door. And again, this is all about people. This is all about people, but in a working packaging environment. This young man, I trust with my life. Made some wrong decisions, but 
Who are we to judge? You know, the people that needed to make judgments on him as an individual had done exactly that. It's not for me there. We recruit at Packet for attitude. And that attitude is simple. I want a job. I'm not interested in backgrounds. I want an attitude. I want something silly. I really want to want a job. We had a young man who came in with his mother, and she would not stop talking. I said, look, okay, fine. Obviously born of some difficult situations in trying to get her son a job. So I said, look, Gareth, what do you want to do? Want a job. Okay, fine. What do you want to do? Uh, warehouse. So he'd obviously been primed. Um, I said, then what do you want to do after you, when you work in a warehouse? Uh, what do I earn money? Fine. Uh, what do you do with the money? Give some to her and holidays. Fine. A monosyllabic interview, if ever there was one. Pretty much what we all say, really, but we tend to flower them up a bit. But again, it's about an attitude. We try to create an attitude, and this is him. He will bore you daft, telling you about the holidays that he has taken through the money that he has earned. He is also another one. So what do you do, Gareth? I go to work. Now, these are perhaps simple things that we all take for granted. I've already said it, but I need to re to go over it again because people just don't seem to understand. It's like a lot of politicians, not like Dory, who does get it, but those politicians, some of the politicians local, and other people out there who don't necessarily get it. There is a fear, I feel at times, about this social enterprise, this odd, odd model, this business model. I had a long chat with some high street banks the other day, and uh, we were just talking about the concept of social enterprise and how it works. And I said, what does social enterprise mean to you? Social business, I call it. Um, and there's a sort of pregnant silence. Um, quirky. I said, okay, well, I can do quirky, that's okay. But what does quirky mean? Well, we don't forget, and this is big over here, so I need to tread very carefully, I think. But they said, we don't understand this not-for-profit. What's that all about? What does that mean? Does it mean nil, nil at the end of the fight? I said, no. Because we all understand that we need to make a profit because if we don't make a profit, then we cannot continue to deliver the mission that we want set out to achieve. So, okay, we understood that bit first of all. But secondly, they didn't understand the legal model. So I've just been through the rounds creating another version, heaven forbid, another version of the definition of social enterprise. And I would suggest that we could all be sitting here this time next week still talking about the definition of social enterprise. Is it any wonder that those people who have an interest in social enterprise want to get involved, get confused? I really don't blame them. That's a personal view. This is Arwen. He of the wonky moustache, as I said. He said I should have trimmed my moustache. I said you should have done, yes. But importantly, it's the people thing again. Working with a business where Arwen works out in the warehouse. This is an interesting one for me, and really, really threw me. Two years ago now, uh, three years ago, and Dave is the guy who looks after the warehouse, said, have you seen Arwen this morning? And I said, well, I saw him at the top of the warehouse, why? Uh, he said, he's very, very quiet, because he's a very, very bubbly individual. And uh, that was it, end of conversation. I saw Dave a couple of hours later, he said, have you seen Arwen? I said, well, no. He said, well, I saw him this morning. Um, he said, I managed to get home. I said, why? What's the problem? He said, uh, his mother died last night. That is a really bad, bizarre situation. But out, the fact that his mother had died was pretty traumatic in itself. But what had he done? He'd actually come back to a situation where he felt safe. He created an environment where... He knew that whatever was going to go on, somebody within the environment, within the organization, would understand. He's still there now. He's been with us six, seven years now. Um, an interesting character. But that was, I have to say, one of the signal moments of Packet in my working career. It, uh, anyway. So, discuss. I'm not asking you to discuss. I'm throwing this because I'm feeling a bit like that at the moment. Um, it says pretty much what it says there. This is my own personal view. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong, but these are my views. I don't believe that you can teach it in the classroom. I need to do it. You need to understand those butter-clenching moments on a Friday afternoon when you've got to pay people and you've had a really bad month. Those are the moments. Those are the things. But you may well have a different view. 
It may be one that Dari wants to pick up sometime and have a nap. Let me know what the results are, please. That are the kind of things. I suppose there's a bit of inward-looking stuff within that as well, I suppose. So I've left out the bull-headed bit, I think. But the emotional intelligence and those kind of things, the drive, the self-confidence. I'm not sure about the self-confidence bit. But going back to where I started and somebody saying to me within the local authority, because I managed to blag 15,000 pounds for a year's project, how is it going to work, John? I'm going to faint this idea. I just know it's going to work. And I was fortunate enough to have somebody within the local authority who believed in me, was prepared to work with me and give those opportunities. So that went rolling on as it happened for five years until at the end of year five, we'd made a profit of 1,052 pounds. You can tell it made an impression. But from that day on, we have been in profit. It's been up and down and it's tough, particularly tough at the moment, but nevertheless, I suppose in one form or another, We've covered all of those, and gut instinct, I have to say, which perhaps you rise against some of the stuff that you've been taught, but sometimes, I'm going to say to my mother, your first instinct is generally the right one. Not always, but generally the right one. But this is about, because a lot of what I've done, and the, the, the agenda, the environments are changing a bit now, but a lot of what I've done has been about Changing culture, getting people to understand this change of culture. The fact that you can do things differently. You can work with people who in any other circumstance 20 years ago would have been put away, out of sight, never ever capable of doing a day's work in their lives. And the challenges are that the mission, a good friend of mine, Jim, but the job creation, sometimes in its truest context, here you are, and here you are. You have social and you have enterprise. In its truest form, the two are intrinsically linked for me. And one day, it's very, very social. You've got challenges with staff, whatever they may be. In other days, it becomes very, very commercial, enterprising. Half past three, come on, guys, we've got to get this out of the door. The two move backwards and forwards all the time. The trouble is that when you get social and you get enterprise, and the two separate, that, for me, is when you start to get this mission drift. That is when you get this conflict of interest sometimes. But unfortunately, you have to make these decisions about the business, that sustainability, to the cost sometimes of that. So it's a continual, continual moving backwards and forwards of the two. The values rub, as we call it, and they can, and they have done, destroyed businesses because a lot of people don't get it. This is my Motley crew, at least some of them. I love them. I love them. Quite genuinely, quite genuinely, the best people I've ever worked with. Massive buy in. They understand customer service. They understand that customer is king. They understand that if we don't deliver, we don't get the job right. Fine. I learned pretty rapidly. I think it was the first sales call I ever made. I pitched for a contract um, outside Cardiff in Wales. And the um, guy phoned me on a Friday afternoon. He said, sounds good, John. Come across and see me uh, on Monday, and we'll see what we can do. I went to see him on Monday, chucking it down in, in Wales as it rains uh, pretty much all the time. And he tried to, to change the uh, specification, the price, everything. Everything went wrong. And I, I looked at him, and I did this the first and only time I ever did it. I said to him, look, I need the work. I've got people with disabilities in Cardiff. And there's no point in even tidying it up. He spun on his heel. And he looked to me right between the eyes and said, John, I don't give a shit who you employ. Can you do the job or can't you? And I took that very, very personally. Not the nicest guy that God ever created, I have to say. But in truth, probably one of the most valuable lessons I learned. Because I learned from that day onwards that Packet, as a social enterprise, needed to be judged on the goods and services that it supplied, not by the people that it employed. We've done our social return on investment. And that really means, in very simple terms, I worked with a lady from Stanford University a few years ago now, is actually putting a monetary value to the, to the people with whom we work. So those who have some pretty significant disadvantages in that packet, we've got ex-offenders, ex-users, uh, people who've been homeless, physical, mental health, all sorts of problems, even to the point where I turned up at work one day, and there was a guy asleep outside the front door. 
and caught to seven in the morning. I thought, hmm, fine. I woke him up. Jenny, I said, do you want a coffee? Um, yeah, he said, but you got any jobs? He's still there now. Strange way of applying for a job, but hey, it worked for him. But the point is, the point is that what is the value of a job to these people? What is the value? Now, the bottom line, the bottom sentence there for me is about converting those individuals like Gareth, I go to work, or Gary, as I say, has a first in black humor, et cetera, et cetera. Because, and this is, don't challenge me too much on the next slide, but this has a dire effect because this is Anna and this is Marie. Anna has a mind like a computer. You give a load of labels to Anna, say, pick out every foreign label in there, please, Anna. I guarantee you, without any contradiction, that she will not miss one. If you want something put together very precisely, Marie will be there with her tongue stuck out, and she will produce an absolutely perfect job. Because all we've done as you would do in any business, is tapping into the skills of those individuals. We tend to work on what we call work chunks. We explain the processes one at a time, bit at a time, and once those processes are completely understood, fixed. Absolutely fixed. And these two are just a big part of the band. Because in Wales, and let's say this is, don't challenge me on this, this is back of the envelope stuff I did a couple of nights ago. I mean, Pauline would tell you I was sitting there firmly banging away figures. But this is just an example if you can bring those people back into society, that social return on investment, what it doesn't qualify is self-esteem. I go to work. It doesn't qualify self-esteem. Or that feel-good factor that you get by actually producing. That is, say, back of an envelope thing, but you get the gist. You've got the idea of what it is. So coming back to culture, and the biggest problem we have with culture was this. Getting people to understand that there are different ways of doing things. There are different ways of working with people through some pretty challenging backgrounds. The culture is still a bulldog, whichever way you look at it. It's tough. We also have this thing about culture, but people tend to refuse to accept the fact that sometimes what it is that you're doing isn't working properly. And I've been through a number of organizations as I'm working through the coalition, as a matter of fact, getting people to understand, look, it's done. Leave it be. The horse is dead, for God's sake. But no, 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 no. We can do it because we'll buy a stronger whip. Or we'll, we'll threaten the horse with termination. That's the idea. Or better still, we'll promote the dead horse to a supervisory position. OK, marginally chung in cheek. But getting people to understand the change in culture that we need to do things differently. And then getting them also to understand that, you know, as a social enterprise, and enterprise is the key word here. This is, we're talking about being in business. And you need to be exactly where the, both the gazelle and the lion are. They have to be there. You've got to make damn sure you better be running. Because that's certainly what we do at Packet. We're running all the time, making sure that we stay ahead of the competition or abreast of the competition, and making sure also that the customer service and the product and services that we deliver are as good or indeed infinitely better than those delivered by others. Why? Because we're a social enterprise. And that social enterprise still has this tag of, careful now, any wafty skirts, the wafty skirts and sandals brigade. But you understand what I'm saying. We still have this do-gooder image, which is not what we want to be. We want to be understood as a bona fide business model that actually delivers added value as well. We can deliver social benefits and environmental benefits as well as driving for profit. The key, as you all know, from a social enterprise perspective, is what it is that we do with the profit. It took us five years, as I said earlier, to make a profit, but getting out of that grant funding loop was actually very, very good for me, A, because I'm rubbish at doing bids for things like that, and secondly, because it was probably one of the most liberating moments that we had, because we didn't have to dot any more I's and cross any more T's than I was having to do five years previously. It meant that we made a profit, and we could do with that profit in a cooperative sense 
what we felt was going to be right for us. So if it meant we wanted an away weekend, that's what we'd do. Why? Because we'd earn the money, and we were going to reap the benefits of earning that money. Don't misunderstand me. Packet runs very, very tight. It's a very, very tight business, but nevertheless, still continues to deliver on that double bottom line. The cultural changes, okay, again, marginally timing, but the candor is very, very much. If we start believing, and I don't know about over here, but in Wales there is big, big hype about social enterprise, and the danger is that we're going to start believing our own hype. And once we start believing our own, then we have a problem, I think. People, again, this is about people within a business context, because sometimes you've got to say, sod it. Let's just give it a try. And I had a long chat with a young man today who wants to set up a business. And he's saying, well, I need to get this and done. I need to get it. And the day that you've got all your ducks in a row ready to go never, ever, ever comes. It doesn't work like that. There are times when you do the due diligence as indeed you will. You'll get as much of it right because I guarantee it's what you call the F factor. There is also always something that's going to screw it up. So sometimes you've got to say, Whatever. We go back. Let's give it a try. This was written in one of my, probably my weaker moments, my not so good. I don't know. I don't know. But I've tweaked about with it a little bit. But I think that is fairly much sums up where we come from. You have to be fairly, fairly hard-nosed. But more importantly than anything else, you need, your own, you need to know what it is that you're trying to do. You need to understand why you do what you do. As a guy in Belfast said to me, why do you do this social stuff, John? Sometimes you need to take a step back and think about what it is you do and why you do it. And then, and I will finish now. I don't want to go on too much longer. Just a message from a couple of my grandchildren. Thank you. Discussion, but I'd like, I'd like you to talk a little bit maybe this group about the difference, distinction between for profit and non for profit. We clearly have a lot of not for profits here, 501c3s, we refer to them as. And, and we are investigating and have been over the last four or five years um, the scene between the two. And I think it's a, a very interesting scene, sort of social enterprise, mm. where you have people with, with profit motives doing things that are socially uh, redeemable, I guess. If you can talk a little bit about that perspective. I think it's just repeat the question, so or at least part of it, so the rest of the audience can hear. The difference right. between nonprofits, profits, and nonprofits, and how it really works about the, the motives behind one or the other. It's a mixed bag, if I'm brutally honest with you. The mantra going back a few years ago about um, social enterprise and the, the the identification, the the definition of social enterprise, seemed to be fairly clear in its those early days. Um, in that um, you ran to a double bottom line, a social and a social, and you need, to, you need to make a profit. But the mantra was always the same. It was all about the profits and what you did with the profits. And those profits went back into the organization for the development of the organization, the people within, et cetera, et cetera. There was no hint whatsoever of drawing down profits for individual benefit, shareholders, or anything else like that. And I suppose in some respects, that's where my understanding, anyway, is where the not-for-profit thing came from. Um, I have my own views on the expression in, in that we touched on the bankers earlier on about this not-for-profit thing. What does that mean? Um, there have been times, I have to say, when I think whoever came up with the expression not-for-profit needs humanely putting down. Because it's very, very confusing. For me, at times, it almost signals a distaste for making money. And that is not the case. That's not the case at all. I think the important thing is to understand that quite simply, as we do with packet, as indeed I'm sure a lot of what you guys will do eventually anyway, is to make sure that you generate enough profit so that everybody benefits in what it is that you're doing. Because if you don't, and profit is not a dirty word. I'll tell you something in a minute. Just thought of something. 
Profit is not a dirt. You need to make, I needed to make a profit to make sure that we could carry on delivering what it is that we set up to do. Very briefly, very briefly. I was in North Wales. I was going back three, four years ago now. I had the graveyard session. It was after lunch, and we had a load of people sitting in the front there, and somebody actually fell asleep. I, Don't you fall asleep on me, whatever it was. So, and this is one of these daft, wacky ideas. I thought, right, now bear in mind, audience participation is my worst nightmare. I don't know about you guys, but I hate it. So I thought, right. I said, I want you all, please, to stand. Now, bear in mind, the audience is a lot of primary civil servants. So they're all there, and you can see them looking at each other now and all this kind of thing. Eventually, they stood. And I said, right, OK, you're on your feet. I want you to say to me, please, as loud as you possibly can, on the count of three, profit is good. Well, for goodness sake, you was like the start of World War III. Because, um, is good. I said, no, 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 let's do it again. Fourth time round, OK, I was being marginally childish, but the important thing is the message is that we have to make that profit. And that profit, the expression not for profit, I think it can, it's certainly in the UK, tends to be a bit confusing. Does that help? Yeah. Sort of. especially sort of in a setting like this, a lot of people are thinking about doing things that are more socially motivated. And it's no longer the question of building a pure not-for-profit business or what we would refer to as a pure. Now there are ways to mix the two together. Mm -hmm. So you can have a, a for-profit business tied into a not-for-profit aim, et cetera. And, and it's just it's so much more exciting because we can do a lot of things that are socially motivated while making a profit at the same time. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, bear in mind, as I say in its, in its form, enterprise is a key word, isn't it? We're talking about running a business. We're talking, but also, we've got that added value, if you like. We're delivering that added value. John, I have a question about scalability. Uh, your business, I think you said, had 28 employees. Is mm -hmm. that correct? And um, obviously, it's doing a great deal of good. It's, doing, it's also contributing a great deal to the economy in terms of your 64 pounds, I think, <laughs> savings per, per person. But my question for you is, uh, it's, it's awfully labor intensive. I presume it requires a tremendous amount of your personal effort and your staff to actually make this operation run effectively. And, and how do you scale something like this up where it perhaps has, has more national impact beyond a single relatively small social business? Good question. What we've done over time is, I mean, we started off doing what it is that we do in very, very simple, the storage, the packaging, distribution. We've actually created a niche market, if you like, because the majority of this stuff that we do now it is indeed very, very labor te intensive. And we get an awful lot of work from people. Packet has a reputation for doing things that other companies don't want to do. That, by definition, means that there is a premium. And we've created and worked very, very hard on creating that premium delivery service. And it's a trite phrase, but about, well, as I said earlier, we understand the values of customers, customer care, go in the extra mile, etc. But packet is, there's been, I've heard it said on a number of occasions, tell you what, give it a packet, they'll sort it out. That for really, in truth, is music to our ears because there is that trust. We've built that reputation for being able to deliver. If you want to stick on 25,000 tea bags on the 25,000 bits of card, we're the people. I mean, it's mind-blowing, but the fact is, in that particular job, we also did a job for a, a taxi. We have a, a chocolate bar in the UK called Taxi Chocolate Bar. I mean, my over, over here, I don't know. And uh, it was to stick 50,000 taxi chocolate bars at an angle on an A5 piece of card. And it was a promotional thing for a um, uh, national taxi company. I thought, do we want to do this? Not really. Obviously, nobody else did either, because we got the job. And well, there's actually 500 odd taxi bars left over as well, so the staff really benefited as well. There you go. How can you take, uh, let's say, the concept, maybe not necessarily the business, but the concept, and and make it a hundred times or a thousand times what it is today? In other words, scale it up to almost a national basis rather than uh, uh, remaining a. You know, basically a single with care. company that's making a great impact but on a limited yeah. number of people. With care. There is a big drive in the UK at the moment for scaling up, scalability of social enterprise. And I will maintain that there has to be growth. I have no, no debate about that. But that's, 
that drive for scale has to be appropriate scale because you will need the big social enterprises that can take on the household names in their own right, in their own markets, but you also need the mid-sized social enterprises like Packet, and I suppose you'd be called that, certainly a mid-sized one in Wales, but you also need the micro enterprises, the one man, two man bands, that work in rural communities like we have in mid Wales as an example. There's a danger because there is also, particularly comes from local authorities and, 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 and government at the moment, you need to grow, you need to grow. No, we need to grow, but it has to be appropriate growth. So how do we grow? We grow with care. And the replication models that we've done, we've done because we've been very careful. I got the one in the first one wrong. And we've taken a long, long time to work with the people with who, who want to replicate our business model. I've got another one going on in London fairly, fairly soon now. But I need to get under their skin to understand that, you know, do we have the same kind of values? Can we work the same operations? That kind of thing. I learned a lot of lessons about replication. But I think the scale thing can be done. It can be done. There's some very good examples of what's been done. Um, certainly in the north of, of America, you've got Pioneer up in Seattle is a prime example of um, scalability. But we have to be careful about what we do. Hi, I'm Sarah. Hi. I'm a third year business student. Um, I just had a question on what gave you the idea for Packet, as in why the shipping industry? Ah, how far do I go into this one? Um, Personal circumstances, if you like. Um, oh, not exactly a Damascus Road moment, but my own personal circumstances. Um, I took a long time. I t had to take a step back from where I was personally. Um, I'd had some pretty challenging circumstances of my own. And um, I really needed my own kind of direction. And I really wasn't finding that kind of direction. So I sort of messed around doing a couple of things because, I mean, what I'd done, I'd worked in the media. My background is commercial. I'd worked for many, many years in uh, the media, news, newspapers, production-wise, and that kind of thing. And I'd worked some unbelievable hours, close to burnout, and all the other kind of stuff that went with it. I actually missed my elder son's first year, and that is, in any circumstances, is unforgivable. So personal circumstances sort of shaped my opportunities. The way we started, I, because of the mounds, thousands and thousands and thousands of big magazines that I produced as, as a printer, um, I had uh, the chairman of the organization, pain in the neck really, because he had 500 magazines that he wanted bagged and produced for his own, the community in which he lived, which meant we almost had to stop production, this thumping great run of print to do this. And I needed somebody to pack them. I have a very good friend, a guy I knew from church, somebody I, who was the headmaster for a school for profoundly deaf. And he said, well, I know different organizations. He put me in touch with these organizations. So I would not want to mislead and say, look, this is completely my idea. This was something that I suppose in one form or another I was moved around and directed to. But once I got there, once I got there and the ball started rolling, then I just knew. Why? I have no idea at all. How is it going to work? I still have no idea. I am not your perfect role model for putting business plans together, I have to tell you. But sometimes it comes from here. It was personal circumstances that sort of just moved me around a bit. Good afternoon, Mr. Bennett. Good afternoon. My name, my name is Antoinette Biaggi. I'm a senior here at the business school. Hi. You provided a quote in your discussion from Mr. Jim Westall. It said, sometimes you have to make decisions about sustainability that are at least temporarily in conflict with your mission. I was curious, how do you mitigate or hedge the mission from being eroded because you're constantly in moments of flux? I like the hedge bit. That's a good word. That's a good word. Well, how do you... To be honest with you, we, it exists and we know it exists and there is this constant tension within social enterprises, always this constant tension is the social and the enterprise, this bit again. <clears throat> How do we cope with it? You just deal with it, which is not really the answer perhaps you're looking for. There is no silver bullet. There, you just do it. And this comes back to the conversation I was having with this young man about getting all his ducks in a row. Sometimes I'd say you just, look, just do it. So when we've got a very social problem, we get on with it and we deal with that while the rest of it still carries on. It is difficult, it is challenging, 
But we don't make a fuss. We've never, ever made a fuss about what we do. What we do is simple. Honestly and truly, it is simple. There are others outside the organization who come in and look in. We get, we've had visitors from all over the place looking for this, let's say, the silver bullet, this wonderful recipe. Well, excuse me, the only recipe we've got is the one that I showed you earlier. We don't make a big deal about what it is that we do. We've never done that. We tend to keep things very, very simple. It's the KISS principle, isn't it? Keep it simple, stupid. And that's what we tend to do. We keep, why? Because we, life is complicated enough as it is. Business is complicated enough. And when we're challenged with producing reports and all this, oh, for all the kind of stuff. That, I mean, sometimes we've got our head so far up our own, it's difficult enough running the day job, let alone having to produce all these other reports. But our saving grace time and time and time again has been common sense. And there ain't enough of that around half the time. There really isn't. Might not be the answer you're looking for, but that's an honest answer. Hi, my name is Mansoor Baloch. I'm a first year MBA student. Uh, I guess I have two questions. Uh, one is regarding the, how do you see the future of Packet uh, in the next 10 years? I mean, what, what, is, your, what is your goal with, with Packet? And my second question is regarding uh, your role as CEO of New Welsh Social Enterprise Coalition. It's a coalition? Uh, okay. I just wanted you to shed some light on, on the role of the organization and what it is doing there. Thank you. I was going to spare the agony of this because I was a bit worried about time scales because this is something that quite genuinely is something I think about time and time again. Because if we're not careful, it may be, what happened to that idea of social enterprise? That was a good idea, wasn't it? Whatever happened to that? And we don't want to be there. So I've actually written some notes, and I can't remember. It's the age thing. It's not what it was. But I can give you some idea of where I think goes. I listened to Lester Salmon last Friday. There may, some of you may have been there listening to him. I don't know. But he was talking about this. It was the forum on non-profit issues. And one of the expressions he came up with, he said, where do we go now? And I thought, yeah, where do we go now? So where am I? My own personal moves, my visions, I suppose, are a future in social enterprise, <clears throat> which is mainstreamed, and we talked about that earlier, which is mainstreamed and it's broadened. A future in which social enterprise is not viewed as an unproven niche area, more a well-established and a credible option, an option that a lot of people within the high street will go to, an option that is for employees, consumers, and commissioners. The procurement prospectus also work hard here. A future in which social enterprise represents a mixed economy that is confident, and this is one of the keys to what it is, social enterprise. It needs to be confident, it needs to be open, and it needs to be inclusive, not defensive and closed off. And a future, if you like, in which social enterprise is about delivery and not debate. There's enough hot air out there as it is. We have to say, right, just do it. Get on with it. It needs to, social enterprise is a pretty broad church in itself, but it needs to be, it, social enterprise it needs to recognize that there is an enormous diversity within now, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we touch on, we also need, within that 10-year cycle, if you like, we need to bring together that appropriate scale of delivery, that appropriate scale of growing. It has to be controlled. Those mid-scale social enterprises that we talked about, well, they create prosperity in, in, in their own right within the communities. And so much of social enterprise, in my experience, is about commu being community-driven. But the quality of goods and services in those years that go on must be as good every time, must be as good, as I say, if not better, than those that are being delivered by other people. But also, those quality of goods, they represent a form of subsidy, if you like. If we say, well, actually, we're a social enterprise, we want, to buy you, we want you to buy into what it is we do, that becomes a kind of subsidy. But the sector has to be, in my personal view, we have to be a sector that ceases to stand there with its hand out waiting for the grants. It's not like that anymore. We have to be 
a sector, if you like, a movement that washes its face. We have to be able to get out there and stand on our own two feet. And we owe it to our staff to create also a sector which is fit in which to work. Too often the third sector, and I've got a bit of a problem with third sector. Why do I want to be third for? But that's a personal view. But that sector, if you like, we, care, we have to be careful that we don't exploit the commitment and the idealism of the people that work within the sector because some of that goes on as well. You know, you'll take lower, lower wages because we are actually giving, helping you to contribute to the values that you have. That's not the way it should be. I don't believe it's the way it should be. But the biggest thing over that period, I think, is going to be, have to be a change, a change in mindset. And that mindset has to come from the social enterprises themselves as well as. There has to be this mutual education process, I believe, in getting the public and private sector to understand what it is. And we have to make sure within the social enterprise sector that working with the private sector, as an example, there are still views in the UK that working with the private sector is tantamount to sleeping with the enemy. And it's not. There is so much that we can learn. We can build relationships. And over that period, I would like to think that there is that seamless toing and froing between the private sector and the social enterprise sector. And we need to be go, going from defensive, which is where we are at the moment, to being inclusive. We need to go from inward looking to outward facing. We need to go from might to to can do and will do. And we need to go from unsure to confident. Those, for me, are the key things within. It's a growing sector. In relative terms, it's still very, very young. But we need to become better enterprises as we go. But I think the important thing is that um, we need to be in a situation where creating those environmental changes and all the kind of things that we were talking about earlier, we need to be in a situation where the social enterprise, in inverted commas, become, doesn't become that synonym, if you like, for unsustainable enterprise. We mustn't let that happen. It can't happen. It mustn't happen. That's a vision. Hey, we have to think big. John, thanks for coming to Georgia Tech today. It's a pleasure. Thank you.